Well, great. We're pleased to have Max Gennis here for today's PSL Demo Day. Max is a contributor to a number of PSL projects. He's a founder and CEO of the Policy Engine Project and maintains several catalog projects in the uh, Policy Simulation Library, including MicroDF, SynthMQ, OpenFisca UK. And today he's going to share with us uh, the SynthMQ package. Max, thanks for being here. Thanks, Jason. Good to see you all. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to share this technology that we've been using to enhance and use our economic data sets for Policy Engine. And I think it's uh, more widely relevant as well. Um, so if you can all see my, my screen. Um, yeah, so what I thought I'd do is start off by just talking about why economic policy analysis relies on, first of all, micro simulation, which I think a lot of us here use, and also data fusion as a part of that. Um, some of the approaches that are used, and actually we did an empirical comparison uh, to see how these methods compare. Uh, from there, I'll talk about some compute and then a demo and also what's coming next for us. So uh, feel free to pipe in with any questions if you have them. All right, so micro simulation and data fusion. Um, you know, I think just as a very high level background, a lot of what economic policy analysis entails is looking at economic survey data sets. Um, so that might have some variables like income, family structure, geography, those kinds of things. And from there, you're going to calculate using micro simulation models, uh, things like how much taxes they, uh, each household owes, what the benefits are entitled to, and sort of all of these have lots of different components and intermediate calculations as well, which sort of gets you to the net income. And you can then calculate this under alternative policy scenarios, not just your baseline. Um, so this gets a little bit more complicated when you start to look at policies that maybe aren't easily modeled with the underlying data. So for example, wealth tax has been um, commonly proposed and a lot of the survey data sets that are most widely used for this kind of analysis do not include wealth. Um, so as an example, I'll just talk about like, let's say we have a 1% wealth tax that people are proposing over a million dollars in wealth. Um, this is definitely you know, pretty different from the, the wealth taxes that have been proposed, but just for illustrative purposes. So what you might have is you have your core household income survey data set here. And you also have your wealth survey data set, which has a couple of uh, characteristics that you can map on to the income survey. So your task ahead is really you want to use the information in the wealth survey to estimate the amount of wealth in the income survey. And from that, you can therefore calculate what is the tax liability, including the wealth tax, um, and therefore what's the net income. So. Uh, this is generally uh, referred to as data fusion, sometimes as imputation as well. So one way you could, could look at this is you just predict the wealth in terms of a point estimate. So let's say, for example, you run a, a linear regression based on this data set. And from that, you're going to find that uh, on average, if you have 100K of income, you might have 500K of wealth. Um, if you have 25K income, you might also have 25K wealth. Um, the problem is you're really not capturing the, the tails of the distribution. So in this raw data set, you actually have a household with 2 million in wealth. Um, that would trigger the tax, right? Because we have a lot of the, these nonlinearities in terms of um, tax and benefit structure. So that would be subject to the tax, but you don't have anyone who's subject to the tax in the income survey after doing this uh, approach. So I think what we really want in this task is to estimate the distribution. So conditional on all of the variables that you have here, based on the model you predict from the wealth survey, uh, you might have some sort of bell curve of, um, and there could be, it might not look like this, maybe it's uh, skewed or has weird spikes in certain places, but you can estimate that based on the wealth survey, conditional on the features you have here. So if you then take that predicted distribution, you can sort of sample randomly from it 
And uh, then you can get the predicted wealth based on a, a specific point. And these will all vary, right? So for these households which have the same income, one of them is going to have wealth that's going to fall below the threshold. One of them might have wealth that falls above the threshold. Um, and here also you're going to grab some, some record that's kind of different um, from the mean. So now we actually have some revenue. This starts to look a bit more reasonable. We could sort of calibrate these results against what you might get just from, from this data specifically. All right, so I think um, this is really the goal that synth compute and data fusion in general goes for, whether it's made explicit or not. And uh, I think the, the way you can formalize this is we're really trying to predict the quantiles, uh, the conditional quantiles of the each record. So given that framework, I thought I'd talk about the comparisons of some quantile regression approaches. So the very simple, the most simple way you can uh, sort of do this is you do an OLS linear regression and you can then look at the, um, basically the, the spread of the data to say what's the, each quantile, so 50th percentile, of this is just going to be the mean, and then you're going to predict some, some error bounds as well based on standard deviations, um, standard errors. So this is one way, it basically estimates parallel lines. This is a very simple kind of um, example that I have in a, a separate blog post, which looks at some data on how home prices, and I've collapsed this to two different variables. So just the proportion of owner occupied the units in uh, an area and the median value of the homes. So you can see there's some, some trend here and this just follows linearly. Just for illustrative purposes here, we also have quantile regression, which adds some more flexibility. You can actually have straight lines that are not necessarily parallel for each quantile. And now you can get into some non-parametric methods, which are going to have some other shapes. So you've got random forest, um, goes kind of crazy here. Uh, and then you have TensorFlow, this is a deep learning approach. Um, so this is going to give you some kinks. This is kind of the innovation behind deep learning is it allows you to um, mix these linear models with, um, with kinks. Max, can I ask you really quickly, why would TensorFlow kind of the richest set of models have kinks rather than just smooth curvature through the data? Like instead of kinks, just have inflection points and smooth kind of rich curvature. Yeah, I think this is, um, this is what deep learning is kind of known for is if you have a higher dimensional data set, it's going to, um, it's going to do all that. I'm sort of blanking on the, the name of the, the term here but basically, I think part of what deep learning does is it stitches together linear um, predictors with these. This is how it in, introduces nonlinearities. Um, so, and I think it, it does this based on um, holdout sets and things like that. So it, it's going to avoid overfitting. Like you can kind of see random forest goes a little bit crazier here. I think if you had more data, TensorFlow might produce something closer to this if it was legitimate in the data. Um, but I think it does a better job of avoiding overfitting. So it, it goes more parsimonious that way. Okay, then is this just TensorFlow on a restricted uh, class of models? Um, like the model yeah. that's being learned is like just a combination of linear It's maybe too deep in the weeds for um, this overview discussion. Yeah. Um, I'll say I'm not like a super expert on deep learning. Um, I tried it out for this exercise and um, my understanding is that this is, uh, yeah, it, it is kind of a restricted, simple model using it. And Max, you said there's a blog post. It, it, does that include the, the TensorFlow analysis here? It does. Okay. Yep. So we can reference that later and, and people can follow up and see exactly what you did. Definitely. Yeah, I'll put that in the post on the PSL models blog too. Great. Cool. Um, so if we want to actually look at these in some data that's more relevant to economic analysis, um, 
what what we did, and this is work that I did with Deepak Singh, uh, we looked at predicting the quantiles of wealth using not just one variable, which makes it easier to visualize, but with lots of different uh, variables. So we used 11 different features. And this is actually, now we're looking at households instead of geographic locations. So we then predict wealth quantiles across, uh, what is this, seven different quantiles. And we use a few different approaches. So one of them is matching. I haven't talked about that here, but basically uh, this is actually probably one of the most, if not the most common approaches to doing this kind of data fusion. You construct um, a score that looks for every record in each of the data sets based on the characteristics that they have and how far apart they are, sort of a distance measure. And you then match the, the closest ones to each other. Um, OLS, quantile regression, deep learning, and, and random forest. And then we can evaluate this with quantile loss. Um, and we use this with a 20% holdout sample so that we're, we're not overfitting to the data. We're seeing which of these methods is going to best predict um, external data in terms of quantiles. All right, so what is quantile loss? Well, quantile loss penalizes errors in an asymmetric way. So you have actually a different quantile loss function for every value of quantile. So the median, um, you have probably seen before, that's the 50th percentile here. That's actually just mean absolute error um, divided by two, actually. So you've got your, um, basically if you're off by negative one in either direction or you know, positive one, your loss is going to be 0.5. And then it's zero if you're perfect. Now, if you're trying to predict instead a high quantile, 90th percentile, for example, we're going to penalize the errors where you're um, too low much more heavily than errors where you're too high and vice versa for low quantiles. So this enables us to say, okay, if we're predicting quantiles and this is sort of what quantile regression is trying to minimize, um, we're going to be more tolerant in either direction, depending on the kind of quantile that we're looking at. So to cut to the chase, basically random force actually minimized quantile loss. It was very close to TensorFlow, but it was 96% lower quantile loss than matching, which was the worst uh, performer in this regard. So, and this is partially because matching doesn't actually, um, it doesn't capture the distribution. It, you, you grab one record, which is the closest, and that's kind of the end of the game. Um, whereas OLS, all of these do predict different values for each quantile. We can also look for specific quantiles to see how they compare. Um, so TensorFlow did outperform for the higher quantiles, um, but for it was actually pretty close here. You can kind of see um, TensorFlow is a little bit lower in 90th and 95th. But once you get to 70th percentile and below, Random Forest does uh, better. And I should say, as I said, I'm not like a super expert in TensorFlow. I think one of the advantages of Random Forest though is uh, with deep learning, you have to explicitly provide the quantiles that you want to select. And random forest, the way it works is you're actually just using all of the leaf nodes that are predicted. That is the conditional distribution. Um, so you can grab any quantile you want from that. Max, so it's kind of can I ask a question again? It performs quite well. Can I ask you a question, Max? Yeah. The, my understanding is that TensorFlow will um, do hyper, it's doing a lot of iterations, doing tuning of hyper parameters and, and optimizing a certain model on some data with a holdout set. With um, random forest, quant reg OLS, and kind of the k-means matching, are you doing any hyper parameter tuning to um, kind of maximize predictive value on the holdout set? No, actually, I didn't do hyperparameter tuning for any of them. Um, but I think TensorFlow does that. That might, at least, my understanding is that TensorFlow is kind of an outer shell that does some of the hyperparameter tuning stuff that um, that yeah, you can we do didn't, inside. We didn't just like the, I think we took relatively default values for things like the. Um, the dropout, or is that 
the name. Um, yeah, some of these hyperparameters, we, I think usually you'd have to use a third data set um, to do the hyperparameter tuning and we did not do that. Okay, so my guess is with hyperparameter tuning, you could get even more performance at pretty low cost out of random forest, quant reg and OLS and maybe even the matching. Yeah, and I would guess there's more, well, yeah, matching to some degree. Um, I think TensorFlow probably has more room for improvement than any of the others. It's just, you know, the state of the art. So um, Random Forest has fewer knobs you can turn, but I think TensorFlow is definitely worth more research. I agree. All right, so in terms of how we apply this to sim compute, because Random Forest did pretty well, um, and as I said, it's pretty easy to get a large number of quantiles. That's sort of the approach that synth impute uses. And the core of synth impute is this RF impute function. And this is pretty simple, especially if you use statistical software before. Um, so you basically pass in the, your training predictors and your training labels, that's X train and Y train, and then you've got your X and new. So for each, row here, basically what this is doing, it's, it's training a random forest model. And then for every record, it's going to calculate the conditional distribution and then select a random quantile within that distribution. There are also some ways to enhance uh, RF impute. For example, if you have um, a target value, let's say that in this wealth example, the survey of consumer finance that says, okay, we're, we have X trillion in total wealth 100 trillion, let's say. But when you do the imputation by itself, maybe because of the way that the income is constructed in the current population survey, maybe you only show up with 80 trillion of wealth, something like that. Um, so what you can do is set a target value and it's basically going to select, instead of quantiles randomly, it will select quantiles in sort of a biased way in order to hit that target. So it's going to oversample the values in the right side of the distribution. Um, another way you can use RF impute is actually correcting data in the same data set. So the same way that we can use target to um, improve a wealth prediction in a separate data set, you can also use it to address underreporting in the same data set. So one example is um, a lot of these income data sets are known to underreport the amount of benefits that are received. Uh, like food stamps. So if you want to improve the food stamp prediction, um, you could actually just basically pass your original data set here. And there's also uh, not really the focus of this talk, but you know, RF impute or synth impute is synth data synthesis and data imputation. So you can also use the same approach to synthesize data. And what this does is it does the same kind of exercise, figuring out the conditional distribution sampling randomly from that distribution. And it's doing it on um, each sequential uh, column in your data set. So you pass in the raw data set, it's going to figure out what's the distribution of the first um, column that you haven't, that you want to predict, conditional on you know, some seed columns. And then it's gonna sample that. And then you're gonna do that again, but now you're sampling your uh, conditional on both the seed columns and column one. And then you do it for seed columns, plus column one, plus column two, and so on until you've synthesized the whole data set. All right, so just, I will share a little bit about how we've used this and then uh, show how the code, actually I'll start with the code. Um, so here's a Colab notebook. Um, I'm installing Policy Engine Synth Compute library here, um, basically doing the, what I just talked about in terms of um, underreporting food stamps. So here we've got a whole number of columns that we're using to predict food stamp receipt and uh, SNAP subsidies to Y column, and then we're using weights as well. This takes a while to run, so I didn't, I, I ran it in advance, but basically, whoops, um, SNAP sub, uh, here we go. So yeah, we've got um, 
we know that the SNAP subsidy in the data set is only 24, 25 billion, but from external data sets, we know that it's 50, uh, 55 billion. So we come pretty close when we're using the RF compute function, we get to 56. And basically what we do here is we grab the X, we grab the Y, and then again, we're sort of passing as that third argument, which would normally be X new. We're passing um, the same data set. We are also passing the sample weights so that those weights are passing to the random forest model so that it's uh, incorporating them as it's training. Then we're using the new weights, which we have to use um, in order to match the target, which is this uh, 55 billion. So that's sort of how it did end up working. The correlation is pretty strong. So 0.7 correlation between the original values and the um, predicted values. And here we can actually see, okay, we've got the raw and now the predictions. And it's kind of interesting, you actually get some, this is just a random sample here, never seen this data before, but um, for a lot of the data sets, it's identical. 324, 216, 1164. And this is because they're natural, legitimate because of the policy parameters. There is um, There are spikes in the data in different places, depending on your family size and all that. So if you were just doing a regression or something like that, um, you would not capture that. You might capture it from matching, um, but random forest, because it's this non-parametric model, uh, you would also get with this with deep learning, it's able to capture that. On the other hand, there are some records where you're going from zero to something that's non-zero. And um, you know, we can sort of examine the individual full records, see that, yeah, this person is likely to be low income and sort of um, qualify for other reasons. Um, so the way we're using this in Policy Engine, Policy Engine is a, an app that lets you simulate tax and benefit reform. Um, so we have a whole bunch of income and uh, income tax and benefit reforms here. We also have a land value tax. This is currently the only place where we're using SynthCompute. Um, so we're sim basically adding it from one data set, which is wealth and land um, to the core income data set. So for example, if we do a 1% land value tax, we can maybe cut income tax rates uh, to offset that. Let's just do cut that to 15%, the first bracket. And now this is sort of using behind the scenes as it's calculating. Um, so it generates a, a surplus. So um, a lot of tax revenue. Um, and the net in impact here, it's going to increase poverty a lot, especially among seniors. So you can kind of implement any policy reform you want, including land value tax. In the future, we're going to have carbon taxes. Uh, we're going to use this to impute uh, consumption for value added tax. All that kind of stuff is possible with um, um, All right, so where we're headed, you know, this is what I just shared. We've got our land value tax modeling. This is from the Wealth and Assets Survey and we can estimate the land value tax from here, land value, excuse me. Um, and we've got a few columns that are also comparable to the family resources survey, which is our core economic data set. So we can estimate land value there. And this is nice because we've got all of our core benefits, tax models, poverty status, that's all part of the FRS. We're gonna use this for carbon emissions, wealth, uh, we have a tax survey that we can use to improve the income accuracy using sort of a self, um, um, self enhancement of the data. We have some ideas on considering the actual reported values to make sure that you're not deviating too far with, by overriding the centipute values. Um, so I think some more interesting things, both on the application side and also the, uh, the package itself. And ultimately where this is going is we want to have um, synth compute power a wide, rich range of policy reforms where you can um, simulate a lot of different policies, ideally on your phone, and you can see all the different parties, what sort of the personalized impact is for you, as well as the net impact on society. Um, so synth compute 
uh, will definitely help us build this future vision for a policy engine. That is all I have. So yeah, happy to take more questions. I have a question, Max. So SynthCompute is um, an open source package that I would use, that one would use if they wanted to um, match or merge or uh, impute data from one data set into another data set. Or, um, oh, what was the second thing? Or for sampling. Um, what was the example? Was it sampling yeah, or sort of, reweighting? Or yeah, it's not. Uh, so yeah, there are kind of two ways. If you know that your data is not matching some administrative total that you want it to match, um, there's uh, two options. One could be reweighting the data. Another is adjusting the data itself. Um, so SynthImpute lets you adjust the values themselves, and then the third use case is uh, synthesizing a whole data set. Okay. And then for synthesizing a whole data set, um, I, I know you've presented that in kind of privacy type forums. Um, you know, how, I guess my question is how good are the statistical, kind of the deep correlation statistical match of the synthetic data set? And uh, I, that's my question is how, how deep are the, of the correlation and kind of moment structure do you capture in the synthetic um, the synthetic distributions? Because that's there could be like 50 variables in a data set, and that's too many deep correlations to capture of like all 50 permutations of covariances. Yeah, so I worked on this with uh, Tom Boyd, and we did it for the public use file from the IRS. And we did a few versions for assessing it. In general, to answer your question, high level, like it does quite a bit better than OLS does, which um, you know, was not too surprising, but it, OLS is still used for some data synthesis projects. Um, so we looked at individual distributions of variables to see how they um, compare. Another thing we did is we did the same kind of idea holdout set. So another way to think about data synthesis is you want to predict records that you might see in a data set you haven't seen before. So records that are close to other data uh, records that aren't so close to records that you have seen. Um, so kind of the um, not too similar from what you've seen is the privacy enhancing part and the fidelity part is predicting on another data set. Um, so that's kind of how we tuned the model. And it did pretty well. Um, we still haven't done as much simulation of tax policy, which I think is the ultimate barometer here. Do you know how it compared to like the TPC group who's doing synthesis? Because I feel like that data synthesis component of synth compute could be really valuable for any group that's just has a proprietary data set but wants other people to have some kind of sandbox where they can play with that kind of stuff. Did yours compare pretty well to the TPC? Um, I, they had a different data set that they were using this on, but. Um... Yeah, I think they have a much bigger data set. Um, so no, we, have, we haven't done that yet. That would be good to do, I agree. There are also some deep learning um, approaches that are just starting to um, come on the scene for data synthesis. Um, it's actually been pretty big for like synthesizing images, that kind of stuff. But for tabular data that we're dealing with, it hasn't quite been there. Something also for um, that makes it a bit more complicated is ideally you would model the hierarchy. This isn't something that's relevant for the public use file because every record is just a tax unit. But for the CPS or um, other data sets where you might want the individuals to tie to tax units, to tie to households, families, uh, benefit units, that becomes pretty challenging. Um, so we're watching the space there. Max, I have a question about, um, and this could just be from your random sample uh, that you illustrated in that collab notebook, but I thought it was interesting that it seemed like zero values were in, in every case in that random sample being imputed non-zero values for those SNAP benefits. Um, I, again, they, I'm sure that I was actually probably just 
the random yeah. draw there. Okay. Yeah, I filtered for illustration. I think most of the zeros remain zeros. Um, okay. Yeah. So that was a question because it does seem like in certain instances, especially with programs where like there's probably imperfect take up, um, you may want to think about you know making sure that those th those true zeros, even if they qualify for the benefits, say uh, that you're kind of representing accurately that people may not be taking up the benefits even though they're qualified kind of thing. Um, yeah. yeah. And then I guess thinking also like, it, it seems like the API is really straightforward and one could even think about, you know, how there are these certain values that you might hit due to program, uh, you know, pr parameters of that specific policy program. Uh, it looks like you could kind of like interact with like a, a micro simulation model in terms of you kind of update people's income feed it into a micro simulation model, see their benefits, what they would qualify for under existing law, right? You can see if, you know, what the totals are then, if they don't match, go back, simulate, you know, update people's income, do the micro simulation model, bring that back. It seems like one could, you know, with the API you've shown here very easily do something like that, um, which is, which would be pretty neat. Yeah, totally agree. I think, especially some of these benefit programs have a lot of different features that are not captured in microdata, like SSI varies with, do you have a kitchen in your home? Um, some of these things vary with how much you pay in union dues. Um, so I think probably we would need to actually synthesize those values and then kind of do a calibration um, Yeah, for the observables. And then just a small question, do you, when one runs the RF uh, impute, I think I, I'm forgetting the name of the function, but is, is there some, can one get output to check like how well it matched out of sample um, when you've done the imputation? Not yet. Um, right now those are separate. Well, yeah, so it uses the full training set right now um, okay. when constructing it. Yeah, I think that would be a great feature though. Um, okay. Yeah, also, for example, like, as you were saying, Rick, um, some of these hyperparameters, at least just knowing how many trees you want, um, this is the most basic way to improve a random forest model. Um, Want to help the users do that. Are you using scikit-learn under the hood? Yes. Because my experience, I mean, I would teach classes on this for years at Chicago, and the my experience was that the hyperparameter tuning would give you huge improvements in predictive accuracy in your out of sample sets. And, and it was really pretty random as to which model would dominate. I mean, sometimes, sometimes just a basic logistic coin flip kind of model would, um, would dominate. And, but random forest often performed up there really highly. Um, are you just using random forest? I thought I saw in your slide something that said, because random forest worked pretty well, we just went with that. Yeah, I think it also- It's a like, pretty safe um, bet. It would be cool to have. Uh, I tried creating boosting machines at some point as well. Um, random forest still did better than that, but I think this is pretty, well, random forest lends itself to quantiles more easily than other models. Um, but yeah, I think it would be cool to have other approaches too. But no, uh, like TensorFlow is not in there yet. I should also say like TensorFlow I did this first exercise maybe two years ago or so. So it's possible that the API has improved. And uh, there's something called TensorFlow probability now, which has been recommended as a, a new way to do this. So a lot of cool stuff happening. Yeah, that's a great stake in the ground. Um, great functionality right now and tons of other things that anybody could just jump into this pro project and contribute. Yep. Yeah, it's just a github.com slash policy engine slash synth compute. So definitely welcome any contributors. Well, Max, thanks for sharing this today. It looks like a really good project with really, really broad applicability. So I'm excited to dig into it. Cool. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, everyone. All right. Yes. Take care.